All right, creationism versus evolution. What about plants, worldwide flood? What kind of survival would there be? All this water, especially salt water. And uh, what evidence do we have that supports one or the other, creationism versus evolution? Evidence might be corroborated by either in different scenarios. Which has the better uh, record? Corroborates more of the possibility that the worldwide flood was actually did occur and it reflects a recent creation and not billions of years of fossil because a worldwide flood would have destroyed the fossil record in a, in a very short time and we wouldn't have the fossil record we have today. So what is that fossil record? We'll look into that soon. All right, let's go to K15. And we look for plant life did survive the flood. So with respect to the survival of plants through the flood, we have this comment from Walter E. Lamertz, consultant in the Horticultural Research, Research Division of Ger Germains Incorporated. I am convinced that many thousands of plants survived either as floating vegetation rafts or by chance burial near enough to the surface of the ground for asexual sprouting of new shoots. I am, of course, aware that objections could be raised on the idea that long exposure to salt water would be so harmful to any vegetation as to either kill it or so reduce its vitality as to make root and new shoot formation impossible. It is growing. However, he sees no reason at all to postulate that the salt content of the ocean at the time of the flood was as high as it is now. In fact, on the basis of the canopy theory, we would most certainly expect that the salt content of the ocean before the flood would be diluted from all the waters above and below, perhaps by one half. Naturally, during the first few hundred years after the flood, the salt content of the ocean would again be rapidly, rather rapidly raised because of much above normal drainage of the land surface. Marsh further suggests that there was doubtless a considerable number of plants which were carried through the flood in the form of seeds, which composed a portion of the large store of food cached in the ark. But most of the vegetation sprang up here and there wherever the prop propagules would be able to survive the flood. <clears throat> Frank L. Marsh, Evolution Creation of Science. Bible flood account is original and not derived from the Babylonian flood myth as critics maintain. The Bible account and the Babylonian myth, many contain, are two nonsensical uh, corroborative myths, but they're too different to prove derivation one from the other. He says, there are so many important differences in detail between the two accounts, the biblical being far more rational and consistent with the Babylonian, that it is quite impossible to assume that Genesis in any way depends upon the Gilgamesh epic as a source. The composition of this, the dates, are not as important as the content. The gods of the Babylonian flood are not the one true god of the Bible. So we have a major difference. In Genesis, it is the one and only true God who brings the flood because of the moral depravity of mankind. In the Babylonian account, the flood is sent because of the rashness of the God Enlil, Enlil and in opposition to the will of other gods. Major difference. Announcement of the Babylonian flood kept secret. In Genesis, God himself warns Noah to build an ark and gives mankind 120 years to repent. In the Babylonian account, the flood is kept secret by the gods. But this god, the Babylonian Noah, or this man actually, is given a hint of the coming disaster by Ea without the knowledge of Enlil. Hmm, interesting. The Babylonian ark and its occupants are also different. In Genesis, the ark is 300 by 50 by 30 cubits with three decks and carries eight people, two of which of each unclean animal 
and seven of the clean and food. In the Babylonian account, the ark is 120 by 120 by 120 cubits with nine decks and carries all of, of uh, Utnap Ishtim's family and rel relations, the boatman and all the craftsmen or learned men, the seed of all living creatures and all his gold and silver. Now there's a difference in the causes and duration of Babylonian flood as well as differing from the Genesis flood. In Genesis, the flood is caused by the breaking up the fountains of the great deep and the opening of the windows of heaven. And these conditions continue for 150 days, followed by an additional 221 days during which the waters abate. In the Babylonian account, rain is the only cause mentioned and it ceases only after six days. After an unspecified number of days, the, the guy Utnap Ishtim and others leave the ark. Furthermore, the bird scenes are different. In Genesis, a raven is sent out first, and then a dove three times at intervals of seven days. In the Babylonian account, a dove is sent out first, then a swallow, and finally a raven at unspecified intervals. The Babylonian account does not mention the olive leaf. Now, the sacrifice and blessings of the two accounts are different as well. In Genesis, the Lord graciously receives Noah's sacrifice, gives him and his family power to multiply and fill the earth, emphasizes the sanctity of human life, and promises not to destroy the earth again by a flood. In the Babylonian account, hungry guards gathered like flies over the sacrificer because they had been deprived of sacrifices for so long. A quarrel ensues between the gods Enlil and Ea, and Enlil finally blesses the man and his wife after being rebuked by Ea for his rashness in bringing the flood. So some, somewhat nonsensical, not practical. Uptanishtim and his wife are rewarded by being made gods and are taken to the realm of the gods. The gross polytheism and confusion of details in the Babylonian account seem to indicate a long period of oral transmission. Nevertheless, since the book of Genesis contains God's inspired record of the great flood, the remarkable similarities of the two accounts make it extremely difficult to assume that the Babylonians received their flood account from a tradition that was transmitted orally for over 7,000 years from the time of the dispersion of nations from Babel to the late 4th millennium BC, when at long last it could be written down for future inclusion in the 11th tablet of the Gilgamesh epic. <clears throat> but this is exactly what we would have to assume if Indians have been inhabiting North America continually since around 10,000 B.C., and if writing was not invented until around 3,000 B.C. So the fact that we have the names of some of these men, together with their ages at the birth of the first sons and their total lifespans, indicates a genealogical record was kept somewhere throughout the entire period. <clears throat> because of parallels between the Babylonian and biblical flood accounts, the flood itself and the judgment of Babel could not have occurred before 10,000 B.C., we find this premise to be true not only because of the problem of accounting for the remarkable Babylonian flood tradition as the end product of millenniums of purely oral transmission, but even more important because of the impossibility of fitting the biblical picture of post-Alluvian civilization and the line of post-Babel patriarchs into such chronological framework. Genesis 11 can hardly be stretched to cover a period of eight to 10,000 years. <clears throat> it actually gives the number of days. So, summary, the biblical account in Genesis is original. In, Bo in uh, Bones of Contention, Martin Lubinow wrote, Ancient Writings, one of the arguments used by critics of the past century in their attack on the historicity and integrity of Genesis, the Genesis flood account, was that the art of writing went back only to the time of David, around 1000 B.C. Hence, no portion of Genesis could have been written before in form, written from, from before that time. It is now known that they were not only wrong, but very wrong. By the 1930s, our museums were rich with cuneiform writing on clay tablets dating back to 3500 B.C. Excavations on the Royal Archives at Elba, Ebla in northwest Syria, possibly dating as far back as 2700 B.C. They reveal that writing at that early date was commonplace. Whereas it was not necessary in that era for the average person to know how to read and write, writing was readily available to any, everyone and anyone through a class of professionals known as scribes. 
In fact, the ancient Sumerians, Babylonians, and Assyrians seemed unwilling to transact even the smallest items of business without recourse to a written document. This characteristic is dra dramatically seen in Elbla. It may surprise some to learn that a clear reference to writing is found in Genesis 5.1. This is the book, the written record of the generations of the far offspring of, the offspring of Adam. <coughs> In the noun separate writing book came to be used in the scripture as also of important legal documents. Several source books are cited in the Old Testament, such as the Book of the Wars of the Lord, the Book of Hasher, the Book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel, the Book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah, and various other books. Several source books are mentioned as being woven into the scriptures, the Book of the Generations of Adam, and, and the, the Book Concerning Amalek, the Book of the Covenant, and the Book of the Law of the Lord Moses. This suggests that the art of writing was known within the lifetime of Adam, which could make writing virtually as old as the human race. To a creationist, this isn't surprising. It is obvious that at the time of their creation, Adam and Eve knew how to speak. Yet language is incredibly complex, and no one understands its origin. The ability to write is in the same magnitude of complexity as the ability to speak. Since God created our first parents with the ability to speak, it is reasonable to suggest that he created them with the ability to learn to write as well. The naturalistic evolutionary origin of languages stretches credulity. Writing was already there from the beginning. Not only does the Hebrew word sefer, which taken from the scriptural phrase, this is the written account of Adam's ancestry, mean book or a complete writing, but the presence of Adam's name suggests that it was a written account owned or written by Adam, not just a written account about Adam. Genesis 2, 4 to 5, 1 gives evidence of being a first-hand eyewitness account of the experiences of Adam, possibly written by him on a clay tablet. The implications of this evidence for the origin of Genesis are staggering. Rather than Genesis having a late date, as is universally taught in non-evangelical circles, it implies that Genesis 1-11 to is a transcript of the oldest series of written records in human history. <clears throat> this is in keeping both with the character of God and with the vital contents of these chapters in Genesis. It is reasonable to expect that the first humans created by God would have had great intelligence and language capabilities and that God would fully inform them as to their origin. Okay, so much for that. This research also confirms the idea that the Genesis creation and flood accounts are the original accounts of these events, and were not derived from the very different and polytheistic Babylonian accounts. It also supports the fact that monotheism was the original religious belief and not a later evolutionary refinement from a later, earlier polytheism. This further suggests... Research further serves to falsify the widespread idea that Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 give conflicting accounts of creation. It also suggests that the higher critical theories on the comparison and date of Genesis are factually bankrupt. Genesis 1 and 2 are the same account. One is a panoramic vision, version, like in a movie, and then it goes into scene 2, Genesis chapter 2, pans in on the creation of man that was already created according to Genesis 1. There was no conflict. Terms describing the flood in scriptural are universal terms. So scripture being inspired by God is to be taken in context and in the literal sense that the authors intended. So all we have to do is read it and see. We'll get into that next time.